Hi everyone, I'm Jane from the Business of Food and um, we host these lunch bites every week, well virtually every week, um, to bring you some of our extended network and the experts within that network to share their advice and guidance about um, doing business in unusual times and um, today I'm very pleased to introduce to you Melissa of Bombo. Hi Melissa. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh, that's all right. No worries. Um, you're actually one of the newest referral partners that we've got on board, but I've got to say, <laughs> I feel like um, you've been part of the group since day one and, and since you first came to that, um, I think it was a networking event that you came to, wasn't it? Yeah, I came to, I would like the Tuesday food focus. Yeah. Well, something about Tuesdays, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and and I've you know I've always been fascinated by the way you work and and what you actually provide people. Um, I was looking at your website earlier, and what I didn't realise was um, you've got a quote on there, and it says dreams are built. Mm -hmm. And I've I've never really thought of it like that before. And I think um, that kind of encapsulates how you make people think, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That came <laughs> from a place of like, you know the it's great to have dreams and we all have them but we've got to do something otherwise they'll stay that way yeah absolutely so do you want to um describe what bombo does and how you personally came to set it up yeah absolutely so bombo um is a business design firm so basically what that means it's very normal to never have heard of business design or business designers before but we apply um a lot of the same kind of thinking that ad agencies typically apply to branding, but we take it a step earlier and we apply it to the business. So we really look at, is the business interesting? Is the context that it exists in, is it using all of the opportunities that are available to it? Does it have, you know, lots of layers of competitive advantage? Is it appealing and attracting customers? And we look at how to create a business model and a value delivery system, as well as a brand position that, really really creates like a lot of that craveability where you see a business and you're like that's so interesting i want to i want more of that um we, we give yeah. that yeah and and what i also noticed on your website earlier was actually all the um all the symbolism that goes with the the wizards and the magic and the, the kind of supernatural theme that says <clears throat> there's some magic in here we're going to draw it out yeah. Is that right? Which is part of my um, brand positioning as well. Yeah. Is um, essentially re it, the idea is futurist fortune teller, and the idea is that strategy is about finding a way to your north star or to your destination, and understanding yeah. where you're at now, where you're going, and the possible ways sort of between. And a lot of clients that I work with, like a, a frequent thing that I get told during during sessions is you're blowing my mind right now. And I, I really wanted to give people a taste of that before they'd been in a session with me so they could yeah. have a mini well, <laughs> I think you've succeeded if, it, if my opinion is anything to go by. <laughs> now, um, you talk a lot, oh, sorry, what you haven't done is actually described how you actually got into it and why you started Bombo, because I think that in itself is fascinating. You know I do. Yeah, it's a, a bit of a wild um, ride. The most important things, I guess, very briefly to understand me is that I was coming up with business concepts on the playground. Um, I would look at, I would look at, uh, especially like games or things that took off in the playground, and I'd see the patterns in people's behaviour. Um, this is me looking at it, obviously, as an adult now. Of course. Um, and I'd work out what did people want, what, where was the opportunity there, and instead of like doing what I did and finding a way to sell, which is what a lot of businesses do. I was seeing where those opportunities were and seeing if I could create something that kind of filled those gaps that I saw emerge. So it's been always in me for a little bit. Yeah. Of course, as you grow up, you don't know that um, your unique job could exist. You've got, you know, there's a book of jobs and you can have one of those jobs and the reality yeah. is anything <clears throat> is possible. Um, so I worked in the advertising industry for quite a long time. So for like Ogilvy, Wellcome, those kinds of um, major companies, and they had brilliant clients, brilliant resources. I love the work that I got to do there, but I always had this challenge of like the point of like the point of branding is not just to create a great brand or to create a great ad. 
what our clients really want from us is to create a great business, but no one's really doing that. And so I realized that I was more interested in and better fitted to that particular challenge. And then the, on the other side of the, court, the coin, there are corporate management companies, of course, looking at business model and those things, but they do it in a really dry way. And business, if you want to create an interesting business, part, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of valuable strategies that are part of that that I use as well. Right. It should be fun. It should be interesting. Like if you're going to love doing it, you need to love the, I think the process as well. And advertising was really great at that. So it's just, yeah, bringing brand logic, that step earlier to the business itself. I think you've, I think you've said it correctly. I think everyone thinks there is that um, glamour around um, advertising and marketing that, that sometimes can come out. Um, and how you've kind of structured it is the magic of before you get to advertise and market, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's starting at that very early square, like what is your actual idea as well as how you deliver it too. But at the end of the day, if you're a boring business, yeah, we can try to make a great ad. But if you're an interesting business, that the, everything else writes themselves. Like I've got clients who have gone and made incredible campaigns on their own because they understand why their business hooks their customers and they love it. And, you know, they're springing with ideas all the time. And if we give giving that power into the hands of the business owner, it's quite potent, really. Yeah, absolutely. Because it is that, well, strategy, as we're talking about today, but in the hands of someone who has a real passion for what it is that they want to build and know exactly who they want to target with that. It's that good. obviously it makes it easier. In between stuff. <laughs> Exactly, because sometimes it doesn't fit as well as you think it's going to fit. Or sometimes you just miss the mark a little bit with, you know, the next steps or your message. Or I know it took me a very long time to um, craft my message correctly 12 years ago when I started because there was no one to compare a kitchen incubator against mm. in Australia. Um, and the ones in US were actually very different beasts. So, um, when you're talking to, a, it's almost not quite a business owner, it's the person with the idea for the business, yeah, yeah. how do you talk to them about strategy then? So, I'll look straight away at, um, it's like a kind of a mini, like a health diagnostic, I guess. I look at where, what the context is that they're operating in, the kind of pressures that are on them. And then I look at their business system and their brand system. So everything between the, the idea and the customer, everything in between that and see, is, is there a machine here that's working? Um, and is, has it got appeal? So I look at it across my methodology, which is four main components and they're each connected to a different um, sort of discipline or framework of tools. So the first is design thinking, which the the goal is to delight. So do we have we created that magic for for this customer in this system? Not only the visual or the brand position, but also um, the actual idea and the model. I look at alignment. Is the promise that we're delivering as a business connected to what the customer wants? Also, are you able to deliver on that promise? And really looking much more like the chess of business, essentially. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of work around um, resonating. So one thing that happened towards the end of my um, Adlan career where I had gotten, I'd kind of worked out how to make a wonderful idea and how to get people excited by it and all of the, all the other parts of my methodology. But I still was wondering what's the difference between the business that has all these things and goes viral and the one that doesn't. And Trends were the answer, not in the sense of copying what a trend is, but to understand that a trend is a measure of what's happening in culture. Mm -hmm. yeah. Customers is part of many different cultures, the culture of the suburb, the culture that they grew up in, the culture of their other aspects of their identity. And the more you understand your, especially your target group and all of the cultures that they're a part of, you can start tapping into that language, into that understanding. So it's not about copying other things with the trend. It's about understanding why it's a trend in the first place and then you can kind of position your business there so that's a really large part and then um, the last is engagement so it's understanding um, how the audience actually behaves because often we either assume what we think our customers do and think and that's usually wrong but also we it's hard often customers what they want and what they do are really different as well 
So understanding what's actually going on here and how the business fits into that as well. Yeah, it's interesting um, because that's the bit that I actually got you to do a piece of work with um, the business of food, right? Because we found we were attracting a customer that um, wasn't really exactly what we wanted. And so understanding that language and that, that um, psychology behind it, and understanding the different segments that we were targeting without even really knowing that's what we were doing, um, just kind of brought it all together for us. And it was then around um, communication, talking the right language um, and having that message heard in the right way, because exactly. sometimes you're talking the right language, but there's that translation kind of I don't know. Filters. What the motivations are what, and it's kind of well phrased by the idea of like jobs to be done. Yeah. So every every client is trying to get something done, and they don't actually care what you sell or how you know how you sell it or any of that. They care about if they can, if you can help them get their job done faster. And when you start looking at what people are actually trying to do and achieve. You find that there's very different splits within that and even within one target market um, we often find this is in the business strategy sessions we often find that the every target market actually has a subset which i call like the wallet out customer and <laughs> it's it's essentially not even everyone in your target market is created equally some are more ready or in a at a moment that they're actually more interested in buying than others because they've just been triggered into the that to have that job or to have that need. And if you get them at that moment with your message, you're so helpful to them. Like it's, it just makes sense how these things connect together. And that methodology that I do looks at questions like that, but from four different kind of disciplines of thinking and sort of brings it all together. So I'll see, say I, I straight away, like analyze a business, will ask questions, especially at the start of a business strategy session or a brand strategy session and see, where they sit along those four areas and which one's um, which one's stronger and which one could could we work on a little bit more and then pretty much any any um, tool within that discipline is going to help them get a lot further as well so it's it's nearly like I've got a whole bunch of different workshops and tools that I can use but I'm bringing out the one that's going to get them to where they need to be the fastest right right and and that's exactly what you did for us, by the way. So um, that was <laughs> that was perfect, and that that's how our recipe to retail became our um, first point of um, knowledge sharing, so that people knew where to go next. Um, but I think um, you you talk about niche entry strategy, and I think <laughs> I think we need to have a little more conversation around that. Like, what is that? Yeah, <laughs> probably the best to start is just what is a niche and, and like why is it even important so a niche as a like as a word essentially just means and in the way we use it a subset of a larger market so when you when you walked down the supermarket think you you know maybe I want to buy some yogurt and there's just mass brands right yeah when it comes to I want to buy a high protein yogurt that's a niche there's a specific mm -hmm. reason why someone wants that difference and when we're focusing on niches, we we pick a subset of our market in that same way to focus on them exclusively. So I work with every business I work with becomes a niche or is a niche already. And we we use that because it's really, really potent because you're speaking to a specific audience really clearly that that wallet out moment, that subset about their particular need in a way that no one else does. And so it answers the why you question that all customers have, you know, why do I buy this candle over this candle? Because this is the one that's most relevant to me. This is the one that speaks to me about where I'm at and what I need right now. So with entry strategies, and it's very relevant at the moment during um, coronavirus where all of these businesses more than ever are trying to get heard and cut through. So that kind of marketing noise has just increased. And we talk yes. about the idea of cut through or standing out or all of these ideas. And the fastest and easiest way to do that is to have a different type of conversation. And that's what niche niching allows you to do. You don't even necessarily have to change your core product. You just start speaking to an audience that no one else is speaking to about their need. Um, great if you're also tailoring the product, of course, that's further refinement. Yeah. 
it, it's just a way of cutting through. And I've got a great example because I've used that technique when I opened Bombo as well. So you would have seen that Bombo had a massive rebrand in December and that was always on the cards. Um, but when I first entered, I knew what skill set I had and what kinds of problems I could solve, but there were so many ways I could structure it. So I decided mm -hmm. to do a niche entry strategy where I focused just on food, food industry. So food product, food service, that entire ecosystem, just to make it a lot simpler than focusing on, you know, every consumer brand out there. Yeah. And what it allowed me to do was to look really clearly about what this audience needed, mm -hmm. let that guide me in how I shaped different products and services. It also meant that when I communicated, instead of just saying, hey, these are the problems I can solve, I spoke about it from the level of the challenge that my customers were experiencing. And what happened is within, within probably within six months, I was like regularly getting quoted in all of the main, like food magazines, all of, you know, because it's not that I was like a special thought leader compared to any others. It's that I was actually talking about the actual day-to-day -day problems people would, were faced. And that can happen anywhere for any type of niche. And it gives you that advantage of, you don't have a direct competitor anymore. Um, of course, there's different challenges there. Like when you're doing something for the first time, you come to more unknowns because it's not been done before. <laughs> so it does exactly. have a flexible strategy, but also foresight and thinking about different things that could happen. How might the market react? What are the ways they could and planning for that as well. But um, yeah. I have no issues. <laughs> Do you think do you think for a young business and, and a person with an idea for a business, it's great to have an end goal and a strategy to get there. But I think what you've just said is there needs to be some fluidity in the middle there just because you don't know what's going to come up and you don't know how people are going to react to it. Exactly. And I think when people come to me, both for the futurist angle and for the strategist angle, I get a lot of questions that are essentially asking what is the future going to look like more than ever in this uncertainty. But the thing is, we, I, no one actually knows what the future is going to look like. Every, the one thing you, you first learn to accept as a futurist is literally anything we take for normal can change. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that helps us imagine, the, imagine more possibilities for the future by assuming that change is the default. Yeah. But what, we, what's where strategy fits into that? Because you don't want to have no plan at all. That's it. Strategy says, okay, these are the cards on the table right now. These are the possible ways people might react and these are the possible opportunities in front of us. So which is the bet that we want to place? So I see strategy as, and it's like, especially you've been hearing at the moment, you know, uh, how can that person predict what's happening in the future with like certainty and it's, for, at least for me, it's not that it's not trying to say this is what I think is going to happen in the future. It's saying, looking at the cards right now, this is the most possible. And mm -hmm. it's coming from a voice that's expert in understanding which things tend to happen and which things tend not to. So as far as conjecture goes, I'd rather the conjecture of an analyst than the conjecture of anyone. Yes, of course. But then, yeah, yes. course, which bet to place, especially in uncertainty. And I know if you look at any situation of uncertainty ever what you see time and time again is unique and especially smaller pockets which is niches so i see niches as being really relevant at that time and i think that's been it's kind of played out a bit in that during um in during this time my web traffic and all these other things have increased yeah. it's not because i was suddenly doing something special that i wasn't already doing before it's because those things consumers are recognizing the value of being unique and they're, they're seeing that that's what's working over what's not as well right now. So yeah, yeah. that differentiation um, and focusing on a niche audience as well. So it's not just the audience that's unique and you're speaking to them at that moment, you want to be unique as well. So put, like get away from the idea of point of difference and tweaking one thing because that's so copyable. What you want to do is have layers and layers and layers of competitive advantage into this big sort of trade secret sandwich that makes your business have a magic that others just can't quite put their finger on. Right, right. That's interesting because we see that in so much advertising and not that we see the um, point of difference so much, but some adverts re um, ring a bell with us and some don't. And it, it is that, you know, I think you can't quite put your finger on why. Absolutely. <laughs> so if 
if you're looking at that niche entry strategy, you've, you've kind of bled into the um, brand positioning kind of thing there because that then becomes really uncertain. Uh, where do I position my brand if it's so fluid, if there's so many things that I can't put my finger on as a business owner, not as an analyst? Yeah, absolutely. So the question, of course, is, and this is this is really the question for any branding uncertainty or otherwise, because you don't know how the market will react to you, even if everything else in the world was very stable. Um, essentially, it's what do I choose when everything out there is unstable? And that's when you look to your business and your capabilities and your interests. But you also want to look to your consumer. What in them changes less? And that's emotion. So in our minds, um, I, I work a lot with an area known as brand archetypes. And essentially, in an archetype is a like a universal pattern of behavior that anyone in any culture understands. So think of the idea of mothers, think of the idea of lovers, the idea of magician. All of these things are territories in our minds that we understand. Yeah. And within them, there are many different types. But essentially, what we do is we go, well, if these are the seats of different emotions and different ideas about kinds of personalities that can exist by attaching your business to one of them and they, they all have different pros and cons you want to just kind of pick willingly or pick the one kind of that you like the most you want to think about what kind of customer that emotion attracts and that position attracts but by tapping into it you're uh, accessing that part of the customer's mind and it enables you to create emotion when they don't otherwise know who you are so it, it get you separate from all of the what's going on in the global world context and you're just looking at how do I create an emotion to signal relevance and I've done you can see how I've done that in my brand with I've got a magician archetype but specifically yeah. advice within which is futurist fortune teller so it's a, like a modern if a fortune teller was looking to the future the way a futurist does now it's combining those two kind of devices together yeah. and what that does in my audience is it creates a sense of like mystery and a sense of excitement around transformation and wonder. Um, and how you do that is you essentially yeah, you create the right level of mystery in your communications and then you deliver on that with excitement and transformation. So that feeling of when my customers go, oh, my mind's been blown, that's also deliberate um, part of the process. I try to get to that in every, in every session by yeah. finding that transformation for them. And you see this with other magician brands as well. So Dyson, the hand dryers. Yeah hands in and then like wow they're fully dry afterward <laughs> part of that is deliberate um, yeah. it's not just yeah. that technology has to work that way it's that they yeah. want the technology to give you that experience of like rapid change and yeah. we see transformation and the ideas of transformation in our heads and this is true yeah. for any brand that works in the transformation space magician may be an archetype for you it attracts um a customer that's very curious yeah so I know that my target market tend to be more curious than others. And so putting that, putting that archetype out there will attract the more curious people because they're interested in transformation and transformation has an element of feeling like magic. So the place in our mind for transformation and the place in our mind for magic are actually closely linked. So archetypes is kind of around that. And it's a great way for you. You can go and like Google archetypes right now and have a, have an explore um, and see which kind of emotions might be relevant for you. That's kind of interesting because um, for those of us that are very practical minded, what you're saying, uh, hello, um, what you're saying <laughs> makes sense and it excites me, but I have no idea where to go next with it. So essentially what we want to do is discover what your brand archetype is. So there's 12 overall archetypes. Um, I do this a little bit differently. So. Um, what I think is that you don't want to just play in an archetype because within magician, for example, you can have Houdini, you can have a part, you know, kids doing party tricks, you can have a warlock. Like these are all part of the same territory of magician in our mind, but they're very different experiences. Yeah. So you want to actually match that back up to your business. So what does this, what does this space cue? How does it make you feel? Mm -hmm. What, what kind of customer do you want to attract and what are your business capabilities that because they each have pros and cons. So one of the big um, cons for a magician brand, and if you're going to go down that space is that people can um, see you as manipulative. 
So you're the master of transformation <laughs> and um, people can yeah, be turned off by that as well. So I have to make sure that I really express my morals and my values behind transformation so that people can see that. Whereas another brand, they might not have to do that as much. On the other hand, if you went for a rebel brand and you wanted to be, you know, a rebel brand's very combative. So yeah, you get to swear maybe as part of your brand, but at the same time, other people are going to think you're creating chaos just for the sake of it. They're going to, they maybe see your brand as a bit dramatic compared to other brands. So they all have different pros and cons. And that really does come back to how much you understand your own competitive advantage and how much you understand your audience. Because these three pieces of possible brand position you know your business and the audience and that you know that brand bridge in between yeah we want to use the strengths of all of them as much as we can and it's actually extraordinarily practical and pragmatic process because yeah. we're not it, this isn't stabbing in the dark you don't want to just guess this stuff you want to get it right because of course. the opportunities that you open up for yourself by getting it right are immense but also by not understanding what you're doing, you're just going in blind and who wants to run a business blind? Not me. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> um, so uh, how can people get hold of you? Obviously you have a website and you hold, um, you, your offerings in December, uh, November, December have become very clear now. So you've named them a strategy session um, and a, Oh, There's, you tell I, me. I can go through, yeah. <laughs> there is um, the big one is business concept. So if you've never um, run a business, especially before, or you've got you'd like I'd like to enter this niche, but like what I'm, what I essentially come up with the actual business model for you. So there's that available. There's a business strategy session, which we create all of that big sandwich of competitive advantage for you. And then we also deep, deep dive into the customers of that business. So that's a full day brand strategy session. Um, and then you get like a big report afterwards that explores how, what do I do from today and how, you know, how do I do it? Who are my customers? All of that just all laid out. So you can use it as like a guide, you know, a strategy for, for your business. Yeah. Then there's brand positioning. So if you've kind of got your competitive advantage, you've got your business model, you get your customers, we then creating that emotional hook. So a lot of people will actually use both of those services in conjunction with one another. Um, and it's the same, but we look in, we look into brand archetypes very deeply. We create a unique position within that for you. And we look at other aspects of brand positioning as well um, from Adland. And then there is strategy calls. So that's, if you want one layer of competitive advantage, you come and call and we, we look at whatever's most pressing for you right now. There is actually something that's coming up in the next three months, which there is the first time like I'd be properly announcing it, I guess, to a new audience that's not Bombo traditional customers. Yeah. I will be creating what's called a startup studio. And oh, nice. essentially it's like a big library of unique business ideas. So each one of them comes with all of that brand modeling and business modeling. In fact, the name and the, the full brand design come with it as well. So you, go, you pick which one you like and you can just start a business. So if you're not actually sure, you're like, I want to be in business, but I don't know which specific idea and they cover all kinds of industries and interests as well. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. Like a supermarket for business ideas. Yeah, pretty much business that. Business ideas yeah. and brands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the idea is like, you know, find your dream job or find your dream, you know, career this way because yeah. the, anything is really possible there. And I think it will also help people understand what I can do for them within their own sort of territory. But yeah, my yeah. website bombo.co and then my Instagram as well. There's heaps of like tips and things on there too, which is um, bombo au. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks for your time, Melissa. I think we might wrap it up there. Um, otherwise we can just go all day chatting about, you know, business and strategy and practicalities of actually getting them to the, to the market. Oh, no. um, thank you again. I uh, just wanted to let the audience know that, um, Next week, we actually have Matt Kuda from IT Genic talking about um, how you fit together all those IT pieces to a to a small business, because there'll be a few of us that um, have started out with all the freebies and suddenly end up with an IT mess because they don't talk to each other or interconnect. So I think that'll be a really good one as well. But again, a very different and practical kind of topic. Thanks for your time, Melissa. Thanks for having me. See you next week, everyone.